two beautiful countries in the world, India and Australia. This is eCritCare Podcast, a podcast about evidence-based critical care medicine, helping you to save lives. Here are thoughts on controversies and critical care. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. Swapnil Pawar from Sydney and Dr. Joe Jekyll from India. Welcome to eCritCare Podcast. This is our episode number 112. and today i'm joined by my co-host dr josh chako so welcome dr chako hi sapneel good evening how are you i'm good thank you and how's things in india we are doing pretty well i see you has not been too busy in the last week so that's good in- interesting now because we have winter coming up in sydney here and the flu cases are on the rise so it will be interesting to see how we travel in this flu season okay hope it doesn't get too bad for you Yeah, having us crossed. So today we are going to do a journal club, and we are going to talk about a recently published trial in NEGM called as Pacer trial. Now this trial is quite interesting and fascinating because so far there was no evidence, or at least a randomized controlled trial on this topic. And this trial tried to evaluate whether transfusing platelets in a patient who are already thrombocytopenic for the procedure. such as cvc insertion will be useful or will it be harmful and so far i guess we had guidelines which are based on pretty weak evidence based on some retrospective trials in the past and i guess most of the guidelines came up with their own kind of arbitrary cutoffs for platelet transfusion for invasive procedures now there are various categories of invasive procedures that we attempt in intensive care unit and platelet count of anything less than 100000 is usually considered to be inadequate for performing the invasive procedures however over the last decade or so the practices have changed and we became a bit more conservative in terms of platelet transfusion and and started accepting the threshold of almost like 50000 platelet count for insertion of procedure such as cvc insertion now the another advance in cvc insertion over last almost 20 years we started using ultrasound more and more and it has become now mandatory to use ultrasound for all cvc insertions at least in australia and new zealand and i guess with that obviously the risk of arterial puncture or risk of bleeding is usually considered to be less so the practice have changed to a safety threshold of 50000 and where we usually transfuse a unit of platelet which is usually the pool platelet and perform the procedure under the platelet cover however these practices all are very subjective and every individual or every icu will have their own sort of comfort zone in order to transfuse patient with platelets now the disadvantage of transfusing platelets pre procedure or peri procedure is obviously it's unnecessary transfusion if patient really doesn't need it but also a platelet is a very important and a very precious resource especially getting a platelet in the middle of night can be quite challenging and it's a very expensive resource as well so we really need to think hard really do we really need to transfuse the platelets while performing the procedure under the ultrasound guidance such as cvc insertion and this trial called as pacer trial try to evaluate uh, the efficacy of this approach in patients who are thrombocytopenic and require cvc insertion in intensive care unit So Dr. Chako, can you please walk us through the methodology and the results of this trial, please? This trial was conducted across the hematology wards and ICUs of ten hospitals in the Netherlands. Patients with a platelet count between ten to fifty thousand per cubic millimeter within twenty-four hours of the procedure were eligible, and they were randomized in a one-to-one ratio to receive transfusion of one unit of platelet concentrate, which is a unit of pool platelets or no transfusion prior to cvc insertion the study was unblinded randomization was stratified according to center and by the type of catheter used whether dialysis catheter or a regular central venous catheter they excluded patients who were on therapeutic anticoagulation those with a history of coagulation factor deficiency or with an ina of more than 1.5 initially this limit was set at 1.5 but they later raised it to 3 based on emerging evidence suggesting safety at a higher level of INR so the procedure involved cvc insertion performed under ultrasound guidance 
by experienced operators who had performed at least 50 procedures in the past. All procedures were performed according to local guidelines and within one hour of randomization. The catheter could be of any diameter, tunneled or untunneled, and could be inserted into the internal jugular, subclavian, or the femoral vein. The incidence and severity of bleeding were assessed using a scale proposed by Zeidler et al. in a previous study, which essentially was grade zero, no bleeding. Grade one is mild oozing, small hematoma, less than 20 minutes of compression required to overcome this problem. Grade two was more than 20 minutes compression and minor interventions required to stop the bleeding. Grade three was more severe, which required surgical intervention, radiological intervention, red cell transfusion, but there was no hypotension. Grade four was the severest of all with hypotension, tachycardia, requirement for red cell transfusion, or ending up in fatality. So that was a grading from zero to four. How did they calculate the sample size? The authors assumed that 1% of patients will have grade two and none grade three or four bleeding. And it chose a non-inferiority margin of 2.5% absolute increase in the risk of grade two to four bleeding in the no transmission group. This corresponded to an upper limit of the confidence interval of 3.5 in the relative risk. So that's the magic number, 3.5, the upper limit of the confidence interval to prove non-inferiority of a no transmission strategy. The authors calculated the sample size, assuming that 1% of the patients will have grade two and none grade three or grade four bleeding. A non-inferiority margin of 2.5% absolute increase in the risk of grade two to four bleeding was assumed in the no transmission group. So they assumed that 2.5% increase in the no transmission group will reach non-inferiority, which was their target. And this importantly corresponded to the upper limit of the confidence interval of 3.5 in the relative risk. So that's the important number. Anything more than 3.5 in the upper limit of the confidence interval for the risk of bleeding, the relative risk of bleeding would constitute contradiction of the non-inferiority and would suggest that you do need prophylactic platelets. They calculated a sample size of 196 in each group, which would provide the trial with 80% power to establish non-inferiority of a strategy of no transfusion with a one-sided alpha level of 0.05. What were the results of the study? Among 411 patients who underwent randomization, 393 were included in the intention to treat analysis, 18 patients being left out because of lack of appropriate consent. The per protocol analysis was carried out in 373 patients after exclusion of patients who had crossed over, met exclusion criteria, or had other protocol violations. There was no loss to follow up. Patients were well matched at baseline. The median platelet count was 30,000 in both the groups. The most common approach was internal jugular, followed by subclavian and femoral lines. How about the outcomes? The primary outcome, as I mentioned, was grade two to four bleeding, grade two representing slight oozing hematoma, but you could get on top of it with less than 20 minutes of compression. Grade one is you could stop the bleeding with less than 20 minutes of compression. Grade two is bleeding that required more than 20 minutes of compression or required minor intervention. Grade three required radiological or surgical intervention, red cell transfusion, but there was no hypotension. Grade four was the worst of all, which caused hypotension, tachycardia, red cell transfusion, or ended up in fatality. So they look for grade two to four bleeding within 24 hours of catheter placement and they found that it was higher in the no transfusion group, 11.9% in the no transfusion group versus 4.8% in the transfusion group. The relative risk was 2.45. Confidence interval was 1.27 to 4.7. As I mentioned, they had chosen an upper limit of the confidence interval of 3.5 to establish non-inferiority, but in this case, the upper limit exceeded that limit, which was 3.5, it was actually 4.7. So they could not establish non-inferiority of a no prophylactic platelet transmission strategy. On secondary analysis, they found a 
higher risk of grade two to four bleeding with decreasing platelet counts, and the highest risk occurred with a count ranging between 10 to 20,000. So that's where most of the bleeding happened at a count of between 10 to 20,000. In other bleeding related outcomes, grade one bleeding, which is something that you could stop by compression for less than 20 minutes, was also more common in the no transfusion group. Grade four bleeding, which resulted in hemodynamic instability, required transfusion, or caused fatality, did not occur in either group. So there, were, there was no grade four bleeding in either group. The risk of grade three or four bleeding was also lower in the prophylactic transfusion group. 2.1% in the transfusion group versus 4.9% in the no transfusion group. There was no significant decrease in the number of red cell transfusions within 24 hours of CVC placement. However, the no transfusion group received more red cell transfusions for CVC associated bleeding. So if, you, if they didn't use prophylactic platelets, they had to use more red cell transfusions associated red cell transfusions to because of bleeding related to CVC insertion. The ICU length of stay was shorter in the no transfusion group. Mortality was similar in both the groups. They looked at a few other outcomes. And in the transfusion group, platelet counts were higher at one hour and 24 hours after CVC insertion. In the 24 hour period after CVC insertion, the no transfusion group received more platelet transfusions. In subgroup analysis, bleeding complications were more common among hematology patients compared to ICU patients and with a tunneled approach compared to non-tunneled catheter use. There were three allergic reactions and one case of transfusion-associated lung injury in the transfusion group. They performed a cost analysis as well. As you would expect, the overall costs were higher in the transfusion group, mainly due to the cost of prophylactic plate of transfusion. And there was a net saving of $410 per catheter placement. However, in the first 24 hours after CVC insertion, the cost related to transfusion is higher in the no transfusion group. So they concluded that among patients who underwent CVC insertion with a platelet count of 10 to 50,000 per cubic millimeter, the incidence of bleeding complications was higher without prophylactic platelet transfusion. They could not reach the predefined margin of non-inferiority in the upper limit of the confidence interval of a no transition strategy being non-inferior to a transition strategy. Thanks, Dr. Jacko. So this trial is quite fascinating for me because it's doing a trial with this hypothesis was quite novel to start with because it can be quite challenging to do this trial. And I think hats off to authors because they pulled out quite stunning trial. Now, when you analyze a trial and go through the key parameters to see whether this trial is good RCT or not, I guess starting with the consort diagram and, and the baseline criteria, all the patients were well matched at the baseline. It is a multicenter randomized controlled trial conducted across 10 ICUs within the Netherlands, which is a first world country. From the external validity point of view, it will be probably generalizable to most of the ICUs in the Western world, they obviously use ultrasound for the insertion of the CVC and, and try to minimize the complication rate of bleeding. They did perform both intention to treat and as per protocol analysis, and there was no loss to follow up. Obviously, doing this trial blinded was going to be quite challenging, and they, they obviously they couldn't do it. So going into the limitations, apart from unblinded, trial, the major limitation of this trial for me is this is a non-inferiority trial. Now, there are two types of randomized control trial that you can conduct. One is a superiority trial, which most of the landmark trials are designed in a superiority trial where we have a placebo and then we compare the new treatment against the placebo and try to establish the superiority of the new intervention compared to placebo. Now, when there is no possibility to have placebo, and you have to compare the new intervention to the current practices. In those kind of instances, you can do non inferiority trial where, and this is exactly what this trial is about, where authors 
proved the non-inferiority of a no platelet transfusion strategy. And that doesn't automatically mean that transfusing platelet is going to be superior to platelet transfusion because they never kind of compared this, the superiority of the platelet transfusion strategy. So it's slightly kind of complicated concept to understand, but non inferiority trials are usually considered not to be the best trial design because there are certain critical issues to understand. The first and foremost is the defining the acceptable margin of adverse event, which is, as you described, the non inferiority margin in this trial was around 2.5%. And how did they come up with that kind of conclusion? Because there was no previous randomized control trial to kind of base their study on. They hypothesized or assumed that there would be 1% incidence of bleeding in a no transfusion strategy, which is also kind of chose based on some, some previous retrospective data, which is again, uh, can be problematic. And so choosing the non freddy margin is always the first problem because then that will impact on the calculating the sample size to demonstrate non freddy And again, I'm, I'm not sure whether this trial is adequately powered trial because of the issue around the non freddy margin of this trial. The second important limitation because of the, again, design of the non inferiority trial is assessing the robustness of the results in terms of absolute versus relative effect. Now, ideally, the trial should perform intention to treat analysis and per protocol analysis, which is done in this trial. However, they use only one-sided statistical tests compared to two-sided statistical tests. And I, can, I think that, again, can be considered to be slightly statistically inferior. So overall, looking at this trial, because it's, it's a non freddy design, it can be biased and can lead to some of the misleading conclusions. Having said that, this is a first randomized control trial on this topic. And again, it's a very well-conducted randomized control trial. So accepting those flaws in the methodology due to the design of the trial itself, I guess overall, I think at least we managed to get more information on this topic and which is going to be much more evidence-based rather than uh, individual um, self-fulfilling prophecy. So what's your take on this trial, Dr. Shekhar? Yeah, as you mentioned, yes, this uh, non-inferiority approach may not be the most reliable approach in a trial like this. And the sample size itself is not maybe as high as one would expect it to be in a trial like this to establish superiority of one approach. And the other thing is the incidence of bleeding as reported in this trial seems to be much more than what is commonly reported. So that itself could be a problem. And most of the bleeding was actually mild. And you would ask the question as to whether Grade 2 bleeding, which just requires compression for 20 minutes or so, would really matter in the big picture. Does it really matter? And would it really make a difference if there is grade 2 bleeding or not to the patient? And the other important finding of this study, although they chose a margin of 20 to 50,000 as a platelet count, they found that bleeding occurred mostly among patients with a count of 10 to 20,000. So it suggests that a count of more than 20,000 may be acceptable, may be okay, and may not lead to adverse bleeding events. In fact, that's been the practice in wherever I have worked as well. We don't use arbitrary platelet counts for CVC insertion, generally speaking. But, but if the count is less than 20,000 or less than 15 or 10,000, we would generally use prophylactic transfusions, not only for CVC insertion, but if there is any evidence of bleeding manifestations otherwise. So to use platelet transfusions entirely for CVC insertion or cover CVC insertions with a count of more than 20,000 is not common practice, uh, generally speaking, in most of the ICUs in India. So although this study suggests that there might be an increase in bleeding complications, with a count of even more than 20,000, it may not be of much consequence and the bleeding may be minor. And if you're able to control the bleeding with just compression for less than 20 minutes, it may not matter. Yeah, I agree with you. Probably what we need to use is a more of a common sense approach. And also it depends on which site you are going to puncture. Because if you're going to use the femoral line, as you mentioned, in, in that kind of site with a grade two bleeding where you can apply a reasonable amount of compression and can stop the bleeding, you really don't need to worry too much about a transfusion. 
versus if you are going to put subclave in line and i in that case obviously applying the compression and stopping the bleeding will be quite tricky so sometimes the choice of prophylactic transfusion will depend on what type of line or which site you are going to use and also if the patient's underlying pathology is itp or ttp where the platelets are going to get consumed usually most of the hematologists will suggest not to transfuse these patients with platelet because of the autoimmune phenomena which might make some things worse so it, it has to be a bit more kind of sensible and uh, pragmatic approach now what these authors interestingly showed is the cost analysis that means obviously if you don't give prophylactic transfusion and then there is a bleeding afterwards people end up in getting more platelet transfusions within that 24 hours after the line insertion which is quite interesting for me because again that means that people have maybe less threshold to transfuse platelets if they see bleeding from the site and again that's another interesting practice and that will probably vary between different ICUs so uh, at the moment, what this trial suggests is you need to be thinking a bit more than just choosing a cutoff to transfuse prophylactic transfusion. Having said that, if you do not transfuse platelets, then you need to be prepared to, I guess, monitor and then transfuse more platelets as you see more breeding complications. So I don't think it will change my practice of transfusing platelet based on this trial. And I think if you're going to use ultrasound, if you're going to put IJ or femoral central line, I don't think you need to worry too much about the platelet count unless it's less than 20,000. But I, I think it's important to keep in mind that you might end up in using more platelets if there are more bleeding complications. The user factors are also going to be very important because the line inserted by inexperienced registrar versus a very experienced senior registrar or consultant with a very clean one puncture attempt is going to be obviously less bleeding complications. So those factors will also impact your choice of prophylactic transfusion. So I guess this trial gives some answers, but it's not going to be a very simple answer. Will you change your practice, Dr. Chekhov? Uh, no, Swapnil, I don't think we will change practice based on this study. And we are not going to transfuse platelets as prophylaxis with a count of, say, 50,000 or less, as the study suggests. It's very unusual for us to use prophylactic platelets purely for the sake of central line insertion. And you would do that only if there is any evidence of bleeding otherwise, and the counts are, say, below 10,000 or so, although there is no arbitrary number or magic number that we follow. So unlikely that we will change our practice based on this study. But nevertheless, it just highlights an important complication with thrombocytopenia and central venous uh, catheter insertion. and perhaps. There is a scope to do more studies on this. This study, after all, the sample size was just a few hundred among, you know, so many thousands of catheters that are inserted in ICUs on a daily basis. That's correct. And I, I think probably you're right. So that probably we need more future evidence or trials to compare different thresholds and then see which threshold or which cutoff is usually better with regards to transfusion. And also if it's a multi national randomized controlled trial, then it will be probably give us more external validity around this trial. So this trial has definitely triggered a conversation around this topic. And I think it will be quite important to follow up from the results of this trial. So thanks, Dr. Chako. That's the end of our today's podcast. We'll be back in fortnight's time with another episode. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time. Thanks everyone for listening in. Thanks for listening to eCrit Care Podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, www.critcareedu.com.au to your friends and colleagues. And please leave us a positive review on iTunes. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. Check us out on Facebook at Critical Care Education. Join us next time for another edition of eCrit Care Podcast.